give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. All of our believers, let's greet one another. You have the scent of Jesus. And with that, the title today is The Faith That Is Acknowledged. People often call these days that we live in the age of distrust. And distrust is more prevalent than ever before, so much so that no matter how good someone's words are, they're not believed. We constantly hear negative things, especially from the government these days. So no matter what the government or politicians say, people no longer believe them. Even though the politicians, they say plausible things using all kinds of rhetoric, we do not believe. This is because the national leaders who are supposed to set an example have become synonymous with distrust by changing their words and turning their backs on each other and nitpicking over small details. So not just the political world, but there is growing distrust in the judiciary as well which should be fair and just. So because we live in a society where people do not trust each other, these days there are many people who record their conversations whenever they have a phone call. Apparently there's lots of people who record that, so please be careful when talking to someone on the phone because they're recording everything. And these days, some phones, they automatically record phone calls because we don't trust each other. It's an age of distrust. And so we're currently living in an unfortunate era where the term age of distrust has become a sociological term that represents the present day. It's really pitiful and unfortunate. But what is even more unfortunate are those who sit in church and yet are still in spiritual unbelief. They are in church and they are giving worship before God and yet they are within unbelief. They do not believe. What kind of unbelief is that? It is the unbelief in the Word of God. You don't believe in the Word of God. Simply put, too many believers are not moved after re receiving the word of God. That's unbelief. You don't believe, that's why you cannot be touched or moved by the word. That's a very serious thing. It means it's over. You hear the word of God and yet you are not moved by it. That's the end. There's nothing else to heal in this world. I hope you truly believe that the last healing we must do is about this Word of God. If you're not moved after hearing the Word of God, that means you do not believe it. You do not believe that's why you are not touched or moved by it. Even during Jesus' time, the Israelites showed this behavior. And that's why this era was labeled a twisted generation and a faithless generation. That's what people said. Jesus performed so many wonders and miracles. He healed countless sick people, proclaimed the gospel, and he used the loaves and the fish to feed so many people and even raise someone from the dead and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Despite all of that, People did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God and the Messiah who would save all people. The people during those times did not believe to the point where Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? It says, will he find faith on earth? Because there will be no one who has faith. We all just follow along. 
and we look at the miracles and are astounded by it, but there's no believers. And even when I see it, it seems that way. When the second coming of Jesus comes, it seems that really Korea is the only nation that truly has faith. Even in Europe these days, there are no churches. Within our Protestant denomination, there are no proper churches. Where are the churches? Those Koreans that left Korea and have set up churches in their own homes. It's all filled with the Catholic religion that does not have salvation. Or it is the Orthodox Church set up by the Russians. And so it's completely covered in idols, the entire world. And even in Asia, there's nothing. It's only Korea. And that's why it says, when Jesus comes, will he find faith on earth? And I think to myself, this word is correct. It will be difficult to find those who have faith. However, in the passage today, a person of faith who vastly differed from the age at the time appears. It was Bartimaeus who was blind and a beggar. The disciples who spent three years living closely with Jesus were never recognized for their faith. And yet, Bartimaeus, who met Jesus for the first time, demonstrated an astonishing faith that Jesus acknowledged himself. He says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And so faith really is the problem. We say our husband is the problem, our wife is the problem, our children is the problem. That's not true. Your faith is the problem. And in fact, faith has nothing to do with the number of years, the number of years that you came to church or how big of a role you have in church. It does not matter. No matter how long one has lived a walk of faith or even whether you were born into a believing family, it has no meaning if it is a religious life of formality. It's no use inside of the church. It has no connection to God. And instead, those people live within the church being more oppressed, more burdened. So even if you were to believe for just one day, you must believe properly. Because God will not be fooled and the evil spirits will not be fooled. You might be able to fool yourselves, but God will not be fooled. So like the title of today's message, we must become people of faith who are acknowledged by Jesus. So I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to receive answers through today's word to what it means to live a life of faith that is acknowledged and become absolute disciples of Christ who enlarge the tent both spiritually and physically. The first main point, Bartimaeus, whose spiritual eyes were opened. Let's look at verses 46 to 47. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. At this point, Jesus had finished his public ministry, and he was on his way to Jerusalem to bear the cross. And in order to go to Jerusalem, he had to pass through Jericho. So at the time, Jericho was a city that served as a gateway to Jerusalem. And so its name meant a fragrant place. 
It was a beautiful city with many fragrant trees of all kinds. And many people would pass by so many times. And especially during Passover, where Jews visited Jerusalem, the Jews would come from all over the world, and so there would be many beggars or blind people on that road. And so it was a good place for beggars to live. And that's why there were a lot of beggars there. And Bartimaeus, who was also blind, was making a living by begging in that place. But one day, he heard news that made his ears perk up. So he cannot see, but he could hear the voices and sounds of people. So he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. That's what he heard. And as soon as he heard this news, Bartimaeus cried out loudly. He said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And here lies a remarkable detail. So if we look closely at the passage, people address Jesus passing by Jericho as Jesus of Nazareth. They would say, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so Bartimaeus heard this. But what did he express Jesus to be? He did not say Jesus of Nazareth. He said, Son of David. That's a very big difference. Jesus of Nazareth and Son of David. So Bartimaeus, who was a beggar, he heard Jesus of Nazareth, and yet he proclaimed Son of David. And Jesus of Nazareth was the most common term used to refer to Jesus at that time. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth, which was why he was called that way. And so there was an underlying message of contempt and mockery within that expression. And so when Israelites heard Nazareth, they would mock them because the region of Nazareth was so despised among the Jews of that time, there was a saying, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's how despised it was. Just like how we have regional prejudice in Korea, it was the case in Israel as well. However, rather than a cry with underlying stereotypes, prejudice, and preconceived notions, Bartimaeus made an astonishing cry with his spiritual eyes because his spiritual eyes were opened. He said, Jesus, son of David. This expression is crucial because the Old Testament speaks of the Messiah coming from the lineage of David. That's what was constantly prophesied. The most covenantal and historical title is indeed Jesus, son of David. It's a very biblical expression. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, and Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. It prophesies that the Messiah will come as a descendant of David as a descendant from David, from the line of Jesse, David's father. So Bartimaeus believed in this redemptive message that the Messiah would come from David's lineage. Even though he was a beggar, he was holding on to this covenant. And so putting it in today's context, he believed that Jesus was the Christ, the solution to all problems. That's what he was holding on to. He was holding on to the covenant that Jesus was the Christ, the solution to all problems. 
Although his physical eyes were closed, his spiritual eyes were opened. And this aspect is crucial in our walk of faith. Your spiritual eyes and spiritual sight must be opened. Your spiritual ears must be opened. Your spiritual heart must be opened. It doesn't mean that you will change just because you are sitting here. Even if you hear it, you might not be actually hearing it. You might know it, but you might not be able to change. So Bartimaeus, he was sitting on the roadside, and yet he did not miss the words of passerby speaking about Jesus. He heard so many things about someone named Jesus who performed so many miracles. He listened intently to all the news concerning Jesus healing the sick or casting out demons and preaching the gospel of heaven. And faith comes from listening. But what about our deaf people who cannot hear? They look at the sign language. It's very astounding and amazing. Even people who are completely fine, they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. And yet our deaf department, they believe. They have come to the conclusion and that's why they give worship to God. Because believing in Jesus through sign language is very amazing. Why don't we give a round of applause to them? People who can hear perfectly fine, they come to church, they listen to so many messages every Sunday, and yet many years pass and they do not change at all. They really are miraculous people, those people. They cannot hear a single message. They live just like the form of Genesis chapter 3, completely stuck within their own standards, stereotypes, and prejudice. They have no change. No matter how much we proclaim the gospel, they hear through one ear and it goes out the other ear because they are above God. Their thoughts are above the word of God. Bartimaeus was not like that. Bartimaeus engraved it into his heart. He imprinted, rooted, and natured it into his heart. It's just like Rahab from the Old Testament. So Rahab, who was basically a prostitute of that time, and yet there were so many people who would come and go from her workplace, and so she heard so many things, the miracles that Jesus performed. So people who would say things jokingly, Rahab imprinted it into her heart, just like that. So through the teachings and words of the Old Testament that he learned as he grew, he firmly believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. And so in short, he was in a state where the word was imprinted upon him, filled with assurance and conviction, a state that is filled with the word. In my sermon last Sunday, I emphasized something pivotal to our new members and short-term absentees. And what was that? I said worship must be the top priority in one's life. Worship. It must be your priority. Listening to the word proclaimed from the pulpit and experiencing the blessings of transformation and growth in our faith is the walk of faith. That's what I said. You must experience change. If you have been going to church for a long time and you have heard the word of God, you must have change and transformation. You must be used differently in your field. Your spiritual scale must be enlarged. You must constantly have growth. Your spiritual dream, your spiritual vision, it must be expanded. 
In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Apostle Paul highlights the core of spiritual growth. He says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. It's the word of Christ. Through the word of Christ, our faith will grow. Paul emphasized two points. Firstly, faith comes from hearing. And secondly, it is not anything else. But it is specifically the word of Christ that fosters this growth. Of course, everyone listens to the word. How come you don't have growth? It's because hearing and believing are two different things. If you truly believe, then actions will follow, if you really believe. And really look back on yourselves. Do I really believe or do I just know? Because the evil spirits know even better than you whether you truly believe. The disciples even were sometimes unsure whether Jesus was the Son of God, but the evil spirits, they were sure. And so if you truly believe, then growth will follow. That's what the walk of faith is. And Paul specifically talked about the word of Christ, not just any message. So it is when we hear the true gospel truth that Jesus is the Christ, the solution to all life's problems, that is when our faith will grow. And so without the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand spiritual things. And that's why when you come to church, you must pray, Father God, let me be able to realize the word of God. Because if you cannot realize the word, you will not have change. That must be your most important prayer topic. Please let me realize. That way your faith will grow. It will go rapidly and you'll be used by God differently. John chapter 5 verse 39. It reveals that the entire Bible is a testimony about Jesus. All 66 books of the Bible talk about Jesus. And John chapter 20 verse 31. It emphasizes that the Bible was written so that one may believe Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that we may have life through his name. So then what are we meant to do with that? We can have life, eternal life, through His name. That's what is emphasized. The word without Jesus Christ is completely meaningless. So no matter how much effort you put into your walk of faith, no matter how long you came to church, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, it's meaningless. Really begin all your devotion with Christ. Satan does everything in his power to obscure Jesus Christ in any way possible, to dilute the gospel. Satan attacks in that way. And so we must become concluded with only Christ. We must align the direction of our lives with the kingdom of God. And we cannot do it with our own strength, and so we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the state of having the spiritual eyes opened. And when you do this, you will be able to move straight forward without being shaken by the various problems and events that come before you in this world. No matter what comes your way, you can really just head straight towards the kingdom of God. When you see with the eyes of the three only, then problems are no longer problems. With spiritual eyes, you will see that problems all contain the answers. And even if crises come, they are not problems. Are you facing a crisis? Of course there will be crisis. 
as you live this world, crisis will come. Do not act like an unbeliever at that time. Really kneel before God. If you open your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears, you will see that those crises, they are an opportunity. And what about conflicts? It is a time schedule for renewal. If you pray, then those are the answers that you will come to. You will say, oh, it's time for me to become renewed. Oh, I'm facing a problem. God must have prepared a great opportunity for me. And that's why growth will come rapidly. And that is the life of the three answers. Joseph was one person who led this kind of life. Joseph held on to the covenant from a young age to the point that his brothers were jealous of him and even his parents did not understand him. So he was young and yet he had the different eyes to see the spiritual problems and crisis. Even when he fell into the pit and was sold as a slave, even when he was falsely accused and imprisoned, he remained unshaken. It did not matter to him because he believed that God is with me and God will use me. He continuously prayed, whether he was in the pit, whether he was a slave, whether he was in prison. He continuously communicated with God and was unshaken. Those who pray will remain unshaken. They will not hear the words of people and become conflicted and confused and shaken and crumble down. They will not be like that. People who pray, they are like that. People who do not pray will try everything in their power and yet they will not receive any answers. Instead, they will face even more problems. God will give you even more problems so that you will really face God and come to the correct realization. Continuously, bigger problems will come. And if you truly do not realize until the very end, God will take you away because you will still go to heaven. That's why what's important, you should pray to God Father God, open my spiritual eyes. Father God, help me to realize, because that is important. And what happened to Joseph who remained unshaken? He became the governor. How could a prisoner, how could a slave become the governor of Egypt? How is that possible? Because God was the one to do it. So I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to only look upon Jesus Christ and make straightforward strides of faith in any circumstances and become people of the covenant who see evidence in your fields. The second main point, Bartimaeus who overflows with passion. Verse 48 reads, And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. When everyone was stuck in the stereotype that Jesus was of Nazareth, Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, the son of David. Because Bartimaeus was convinced and had assurance that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah of the Old Testament, the main figure of the covenant. He believed that if he could meet Jesus, then his problems would be solved once and for all. He had that faith. He had never met Jesus, but he had this faith based on the rumors that he had heard. And so he believed nothing is impossible for this Jesus. He will be able to open my eyes. He had the clear faith. And that is why when the crowd scolded Bartimaeus to be quiet, he shouted even louder. No matter what the crowd was saying or how they scolded him, he shouted even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And this is something that is impossible to do if he did not have assurance. The famous commentator William Barclay expressed Bartimaeus in this passage this way. He said, nothing could stop him from crying out to see Jesus. This is the extent to which he had assurance. 
that's what your walk of faith should be like as well. And nothing could be a barrier or an obstacle for Bartimaeus. Nobody could stand in his way. Verses 49 to 50 reads, And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Jesus heard Bartimaeus' plea and called on him. And at that time, he sprang up like a spring and ran up to Jesus. How could someone who was blind spring up and run to someone? It was because he did that without any calculations. He just blindly ran to the place where he heard Jesus' voice. And he even discarded the cloak that he had while he was a beggar. Why does it mention the cloak? It's because it was very important at the time. So it was like a desert place. And so in the day, it would be very hot. And in the nighttime, it would be very cold. And so this cloak was very important. And yet he discarded everything that was in his way. And he did not know what obstacles were before him because he did, could not see. But he did not care about any of those things and immediately ran towards Jesus like a spring. We can see just how much assurance he had and how, yearn, how much yearning he had. Really, may your walk of faith look like this as well. If you keep thinking of different things and worries and have different calculations in your mind, when will you receive answers? I constantly say to you, you must live a simple life, a simple walk of faith. For me personally, I like people who are simple. I like people who go straight forward even if they make a mistake. Because those who are complicated and have calculations, they will be unable to receive answers. And when you come to give worship, may you come with the same passion as Bartimaeus running towards Jesus. And this does not refer to running in a hurry because you are late for worship. And people who are constantly late to worship and you always end up sitting on the very top floor, that's not what I'm talking about. Bartimaeus' passion is about longing for worship and so arriving early to prepare for the worship and even preparing for the worship on the Saturday night and coming early at least 30 minutes before worship to go into prayer and prepare for the worship. And also if you have a role or a stewardship within the church, you must do it with a passion that goes all into it. Revelation chapter 3 verse 16 reads, So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is the word of God. Living a lukewarm walk of faith so you don't know whether you are inside of it, whether you are outside of it and you have picked a country for the 237 Nation missions, and yet you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what meetings to go to. So may all believers of Yewon Church live a life that is far from being lukewarm and really radiate the passion for the gospel. Verses 51 to 52 reads, And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Jesus asked Bartimaeus, What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus immediately answered, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. Immediately, Bartimaeus recovered his sight. And it did not just end there. But the passage shows that Bartimaeus moved on to a life of being a disciple that followed Jesus. 
It says he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. He did not go out into the world to boast about his answers or become careless because of his answers, but he decided to follow God. That's what is important, becoming conceited and thinking and becoming careless and thinking, I have received answers to all my problems. Rather than that, you must truly believe that you must become more devoted to God after receiving answers. So this man, Bartimaeus, who was a beggar and blind, lived without any hope. He met Jesus Christ and gained complete physical and spiritual restoration. And his life underwent a major transformation as he began to live a life testifying for Jesus Christ. And if you go to heaven, you will be able to meet Bartimaeus. And over 2,000 years, we constantly talk about Bartimaeus, even though he only met Jesus once. And so those who have truly received grace, healing, and restoration must elevate their spiritual level to the next step. That is what is normal, going on to the next step. You must advance to the next step. To those who have eyes to see and ears to hear but are not able to, you must be able to give the true gospel and testify Jesus Christ. You must live the life of a disciple. So I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to become field evangelism disciples who bring about actual healing and restoration of faith like Bartimaeus in your everyday life. This is the conclusion. There's a term called coming out that I'm sure you have heard quite often. And generally, the term coming out, it refers to the act of revealing one's identity despite facing difficulties. And so these days, Individuals who are within the LGBTQ community use this expression to disclose their sexual identity. However, originally it was used when women disclo disclosed their lives in the past when it was not easy to do so. And so it w required considerable courage. So. Originally, the term coming out was used to publicly reveal that you were that you are a christian and it was dangerous and required courage at the time because believing in christ you had to risk your life people mocked you even when i was young we would carry around the Bible in our hands because we do not have these kind of electronics. But there were people who were very ashamed to carry that Bible and so they would hide their Bible somewhere, especially men. So believing in Christ was something that people were embarrassed about. So they would hide it and they would make their wives hold the Bible and then they would just take it when they got to church. And so the constantly church uh, constantly the bibles became smaller and smaller and smaller. And so at the time the term coming out was about saying I believe in Christ. And so within a community even these days people cannot say that they are Christian because you might face some kind of uh, prejudice or judgment. or you might be at a loss within a relationship or a community. And so the term coming out was used very firstly when people would come out to say, I am a Christian. And so what is most important here though is holding on to that Christ and changing the field through a life that accurately testifies to this Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, 
Apostle Paul describes the identity of Christians, saying, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We are the aroma of Christ. In other words, we have the influence of Christ upon others. No matter who we meet in the fields, we are to be fragrant beings that assert the good influence of the gospel. No matter what we do, no matter where we go. You must not lose hold of your identity. Amen. I am a Christian. That person is someone I must evangelize. The person you are facing, they are someone you have to evangelize. Even when you are eating in a restaurant, then how must you act? The very first thing I do is give a tip. Because it's important for people to open their heart. So I'm very generous with my tip that I give. Why? Because they are someone I must evangelize. Christians, you must seem cool before other people. Do not complain about little things. Do not constantly say negative things that pe put people in a bad mood. You'll not be able to evangelize. That's why people say, just believe it yourself. You are the aroma of Christ. Amen. The aroma. And you must have that aroma, aroma coming out of you. It must be that way when you meet people. And so people who are closer to you, the closer they are, the more they must be able to really see the aroma of Christ inside of you. And so if they cannot, cannot see the aroma of Christ inside of you, and they think, the more I see you, the more that you are not a good person, that's wrong. The more they meet you, the more they must want to grow close to you. This is what it means to be a true person of faith that is acknowledged by Jesus. So I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to practice such gospel-centered coming out lives and become ones who radi radiate the fragrance of Christ. Let us pray. Living Father God, today you gave us the living word. Please let us become Yewon believers, be just like Bartimaeus who had this accurate faith and assurance. And let it be the day where we experience true healing of everything within Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.